All right. Mm -hmm. I think we got a nice crowd going here. Let's uh, let's have some claps to start this thing off, everybody. Wonderful. Okay. And um, you know, maybe we'll leave that to later. But uh, so thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I'm really, really excited to uh, have this um, panel of speakers here with us today. Um, I'll say a couple of words about uh, the organization first, and then I'll ask you guys if it's okay to say one or two words about what you do within XR Access. So, um, oh, what have we got here? Ah, we've got a camera bot <laughs> flying. All right. There you go. Cool. Uh, trying to a rogue uh, camera bot. Clear, clear the skies here. <laughs> All right. So, um, our guests today are from an organization called XR Access, and um, I was approached recently by them to find out if there was any way of us uh, for us to collaborate uh, between the work they're doing, making in particular uh, this technology more accessible to users across the world and across different devices and platforms, and what we're doing in education and training. And immediately, yes, um, our mission at Educators in VR is to help democratize education for all through the medium of XR, and we won't be done until it's accessible to everybody. Uh, and so we really need the expertise and help and support from uh, people like this. And today, uh, they're going to give us a presentation about the work they're doing, about how we can get involved and how you can get involved. And then they want to hear from you as well about your experiences with accessibility challenges or solutions in classroom teaching and training settings because they're not just here to share what they're doing, but to listen and learn and adapt along with us. And hopefully we'll have a, a, a lasting collaboration evolve from this meeting today. So having said all of that as a context, um, Joel, uh, in the yellow here, would you like to say a couple of words about um, your uh, involvement with XR Access? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Uh, so, hi, I'm uh, Joel Ward. Uh, I am actually the lead for the hardware devices group for XR Access. Uh, I joined last year when we uh, formed, uh, actually almost a year ago. And um, the hardware devices group obviously is focusing on hardware devices, platforms, and accessories uh, as part of the uh, virtual and augmented reality revolution and how to uh, make them more accessible. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you very much. I like how you call it a revolution. This is a revolution, guys. You heard it here. <laughs> Fantastic. In the purple in, in the middle, we have uh, Dylan. Dylan, do you want to share a couple of words about your, your role in the organization? Yes, hello. Uh, can everyone Hi. hear me okay? Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> Who's, who, it's her first time. Give her some love. It's her first time in all space today. Give her some big That's love. Right. <laughs> That's yeah, right. all right. It's pretty intuitive, as I was telling you earlier, Daniel, which I appreciate right. very much. tech is accessible to people with disabilities and at the end of the day with how the workplace is changing we all know that XR will likely be a part of how we all work so we want to ensure that people with disabilities specifically can enter the future workplace and, and be successful and add, let me add to that and say I am also the advisor to XR access and I support the day-to-day -day. work with Dylan and Joel they are two leads of six working groups that we have in total focused on different issues one of which is education Wonderful. Thank you very much. So now we've met the, the panel. I'm actually going to hand over to, um, well, we're going to have a, a, a presentation about your work. And then Laurel, with her background in diversity, uh, inclusion, and accessibility, is going to moderate the Q&A session as we follow. Just before we launch into that, I do want to say a quick word for everybody uh, about an exciting project we have an announcement from following right on from this. 
and this is Rohit Chalba and Vrox. Uh, he's going to be announcing. Where are you, Rohit? Um, there you are in the uh, fourth row up to the left. Um, got an announcement about. Is it a competition? I think it's a competition uh, for students to get involved with. So please stick around for that exciting announcement, um, which will be leading up to our students in the R conference. And with that. Guys, uh, Laurel, if you want to manage the slides, I'm going to come off the stage here and swap with you. All and right, over to you. your show. Yeah. All right, go for it. You ready? Give me some love, All guys. Right. All right. Who wants to start? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> start away. <laughs> Joel, or Dylan, uh, Joel, would you mind giving the intro to what XR is? I think some people in the room are already familiar. Yeah, well, so I assume everybody in here knows what uh, VR <laughs> is because you're either in VR or using the desktop app with a uh, three-dimensional uh, view. Um, we, we use the term XR and, and the group is XR Access. Um, if you don't know, and I don't know, if, I think this is, this is necessarily knowledge everybody knows now, that's the industry term that most of us are using for extended reality or cross reality that covers virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and anything in between. Um, so from VR, what we're doing here, to augmented reality, where you might have a pair of glasses or a tablet uh, overlaying over the, uh, the real world, and then in between, which um, some people consider mixed reality, where it's more three-dimensional augmented reality um, that kind of brings what VR can do into the real world. And so we're covering all of that in all forms, not just headsets. There still are devices, obviously your phones and your tablets use uh, AR, um, and there's still uh, some VR that you pop your phone in, you know, that still technically falls under, under this as well. But this, this covers everything. Um, and again, the revolution that's coming, uh, we're all using this now, but um, it will only grow in, now in the 2020s. Uh, we expect to see this, this growth exponential over the next couple of years. Uh, especially more on the AR side, VR growing to deal as well, but um, everybody's going to start using this, which brings up the point here where we want to make sure this is going to be accessible when this really explodes uh, to a much larger user base. Mm -hmm. I'll just add one thing. We're hoping towards the end of this conversation, we can engage everybody here to see how you're seeing XR being used in the classroom, what are some of the challenges you're seeing, and what you're seeing as helpful. All right. On to the next slide, Laurel. Okay. Dylan, would you mind taking this slide? All or right. Joel? All right. Absolutely. No, um, so XR is uh, something that, that's kind of rapidly becoming a part of a lot of different industries. Um, a lot of places have found it really useful for reviewing 3D objects. Um, you see that in architecture, you see that in uh, car makers, because uh, it turns out it's a lot easier to stick your CAD files into a, a VR simulation than it is to make an actual physical prototype you know, through 3D printing or some other means. Um, so there's been a lot of realization already uh, amongst various enterprise of the opportunity for uh, XR in anything that really wants to, to feature 3D visualization of objects or information. Um, you see it for uh, communication. You see it, uh, you know, obviously, here we are. Um, you see it for <laughs> training uh, and just a, a million other different purposes uh, and kind of more every day. Um, and so even as it's, you know, perhaps trickling a little bit more slowly into the hands of consumers, as many uh, in this room I'm sure would have liked, um, there's a lot of places in industry where it's already uh, being embraced. One thing I'll mention here is, uh, as actually health will be a big, big space that this is already uh, starting to be used and will expand as well. And as we see what's going on with uh, the COVID-19 response, this is the kind of thing that um, if we had more of this, uh, it actually mm -hmm. could uh, really propel this industry as well. So um, it will likely touch, as, as Dylan mentioned, all kinds of areas, um, some we might not even thought of yet, uh, which is again, why we wanna be prepared Let's, let's start figuring this stuff out now before it, um, it takes over everything. Next right. slide now. It's up there. 
Uh, I didn't I see I that one. Did you, so, yeah, no, one this is the second one. It says, what, it has a question, what XR apps are you familiar with? Yeah, that hasn't come up. Okay. Um, we, okay. Yep, there it is. We're, we're the, yes, it we're, is. Nope, yeah, we're, well, okay. <laughs> So I think these these discussion questions I think are are I don't I don't know that uh, in this format we want to necessarily uh, go through the process of muting and unmuting everybody but um, these are just some things I think to to think about and keep in your head and then at the end I think we we'd love to have a, a discussion if that's possible. Okay. Um, So you see the question up on the screen? Is everybody, can everybody see? Everyone see the slides? Yeah, okay. If you can see the slides, give us hearts. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. There's a question up there. Yeah, so this is what we really want everybody to think about it. And I think the discussion at the end, we'll, we'll really get into this. Um, mm -hmm. What we found is, uh, is with all new technologies, uh, this isn't often thought of off the bat. And this is no different than even the web when it was new in applications. Uh, and even buildings uh, decades ago, uh, this just was not considered. So we, we're asking that question now, how do, we, how do we make sure this kind of technology is accessible uh, with uh, people uh, uh, with disabilities? So think about this as, we're get, as we go through this, as we really, we're curious, this is what we're, what we're doing extra access. How can we make this better? Uh, we don't have all the answers. We're not actually here today to tell you what the answers are because we honestly don't know. And that's why we want participation from all kinds of people from around the world um, in all different situations with all different abilities uh, thinking about this. And that's how we'll actually make this work. Yeah, so I can just jump in for a second. In the, in the US alone, one in four people have a disability. And so I don't have the specific breakdown for you know, students under the age of 18 that have a disability, but there are quite a few. And these kids are in the classroom. And XR technology is beginning to infiltrate the classroom. So it's, you know, we want to make sure all kids can use it and participate in it, but that they're prepared for the future that where XR will be ubiquitous, basically. Next slide. So I, I think that leads into to the next portion of the talk, which is that, um, first of all, what, the first question of how Dylan, you make, uh, we're having trouble with yes. your audio. If you could get your microphone closer, it's getting hard to hear you. Yeah. Oh, yes. There, thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. Can you hear me OK? There we go. Yeah, sorry, everybody. Yep. I. I uh, Perhaps with, with great hubris, I uh, thought that I could attempt to both stream this and participate in it from my <laughs> humble internet connection. And I think it may be too much for it. Um, so we paused the stream, uh, but the recording will go on as long as my internet can hold out. <laughs> um, so if everybody can still hear me, uh, I was saying that the first thing about that you need to know about making XR accessible is that you still have to follow a lot of the guidelines that exist for 2D accessibility. A lot of traditional accessibility needs, um, you know, still apply in this new format. Um, you know, we have a couple of broad categories up on screen right now, uh, visual, cognitive, uh, mobility, and auditory. Um, you know, every single one of those and, and the many things that don't fit cleanly into one of those categories uh, have techniques uh, and technologies associated with uh, and so the first step in making XR accessible is going to be utilizing the, those techniques and technologies and making sure that VR is compatible with them. Uh, I think one of the challenges we're facing now is, you'll see in a few slides here, is that things like subtitles uh, are pretty well-known well -known quality in, in 2D spaces, but in 3D spaces need to really be rethought. Uh, should we move to the, the next slide? So there's no video on this, um, remember? OK, that's fine. Um, so in addition to existing needs, though, there are also brand new needs uh, for accessibility. Um, things especially to do with the, the immersive 3D kind of VR uh, nature of it. Um, things around, uh, you know, for example, motion-tracked controllers. Um, that's something that for 
many people is incredibly valuable. Uh, it means that, that you know if you rather than uh, in the past you know you, you're playing Legend of Zelda or something, you hit a button and it swings a sword. Well, now you can just swing your dang sword. Um, but at the same time, that comes with the challenge of well, for people that could press a button but couldn't swing a sword around, uh, mm -hmm. we don't want them to be totally left you know left out to dry. Um, and so the challenges like that um, you know can be resolved through smart design. Uh, they can be resolved through um, technologies like uh, the one we're featuring in this video here, uh, a plugin called Walk-In VR um, that lets folks with motor impairments um, recreate controller movements and simulate being seated or standing uh, and various other things to make sure that they can use these applications that, uh, you know, as they're designed, just require you to have two hands in a full range of motion or they just plain don't. Yeah, I could just uh, jumping in for one second. The the potential of XR yeah. is is absolutely staggering, particularly in the classroom. We all know kids love to be engaged and sort of you know be able to interact and play with games. But imagine you have a student that's in a wheelchair. You don't want them to be left on the side. So, as we move forward, making sure that all kids are included, I mean, is is important. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially in the, the education context, right? It's vital to make sure that everybody can participate. Uh, or else, you know, it's just going to be, uh, again, people, people left in the dust. That's no good. Um, should we get the next slide? Mm -hmm. I think this one, is, yes. Uh, there, yeah, there's no video on here. Sorry, not accessible. Right. Um, they were not accessible, no unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's uh, sadly uh, some challenges with that still, and even mm -hmm. in alt space. Um, but I think the what this slide was speaking to is that uh, again, things like subtitles um, that we know how to do in 2D, we need to reinvent with 3D, right? Because even looking at at something like the humble subtitle, which is really an absolute lifeline um, for anybody with a, an auditory uh, impairment. Um, you know, you need to figure out, okay, well, it's not, I can't just put these on the bottom of the person's screen and assume that everything's gonna work out, right? You need to indicate things like who's talking, how far away are they? Um, what happens if I put my hand up and if I was in VR and not on my desktop, this is where I would put my hand in front of my face. <laughs> um, if, if I put my hand up or I put objects in between me and the subtitles, um, how do we still show the subtitles without totally breaking immersion? Um, these are a lot of really interesting open challenges. Um, and they're things that, uh, you know, some groups, Alchemy Labs were featuring here their vacation simulator um, because they did a, a really great job of solving some of these problems. Um, but I, I know Joel can maybe speak to this a bit because one, one of the problem challenges here is not just getting individual app studios to, to uh, solve these problems. It's solving them on the hardware level and solving them in such widespread ways that everybody with impairments can use them without having to just shop around for the apps that specifically support them. Right. Yeah, so what Alchemy did, they had they built into their app, but the challenge we have, and, and, and the company I work for, we build software applications. We don't do hard hardware, um, but we Right now, the way it works, uh, and this is kind of like the way it was at the beginning of the web and, and a lot of other uh, platforms, is you have to build your own versus it being built into, say, the Unity platform or Unreal, and then into the systems like, like Oculus and Vive and et cetera, um, where you just have these tags like you have with the web that you just need to make sure you program, but you don't have to create the entire uh, set of features, uh, which then would just be a one-off for your particular app. And so, there are some efforts out there that already are, are, are building um, add-ons to some of these platforms, but it's not yet built into uh, the platforms on a whole. And so you have um, makers like all can be doing their own work and showing what could be done, but it does need to be standard up. Mm -hmm. All right, should we get the next slide? Um, so one more thing we'll, we'll speak to here with regards to, to XR is that um, XR has the possibility not you know not only for these 
all these new applications that are coming out um, to, to you know, provide a lot of value to folks. But uh, XR has the opportunity to help people with disabilities in the real world as well. Um, you know, we see up here on, on screen several uh, different research uh, studies. There's tons of research going in this area um, of using things like augmented reality to help people with visual impairments uh, find objects that, you know, maybe these headsets know are there and can help uh, recognize and identify and point out to the users um, and help them, you know, overcome some of these challenges that, that come from a lack of accessibility in environments all over the world. Um, so it's important to think of, of XR not only as a, a, a tool that uh, will need to make accessible to people, but as an opportunity to make everything else uh, more accessible as well. Um, Devin, Joe, you want to you want to add on to that? Yeah, just adding. You know, I keep coming back to the students, of course. Um, but but let's say you know XR is is opening up opportunities for people to collaborate remotely. So some of the students that have maybe traditionally you know done homeschooling, or some of the students that aren't able to join a regular classroom, XR has the potential to allow them to engage, allow them to not just engage in the content or the curriculum, but also with their you know, with the other kids, which is a, it's a great opportunity for the kids that are typically stuck at home. Yeah, so one thing I'll say for, for what we're doing with XR Access, uh, the, the first goal, uh, at least in my mind, was to make the platforms accessible, right? So for whatever we're doing now, that we can ensure either now or not too far in the future that these platforms are accessible. But then the other half of it is how could we also use it to make whatever accessible uh, to people that might not be able to do certain things or, or do them in the, in the same way. Um, again, physical access to places, and there's many reasons people don't have access to places, but uh, right now we're all kind of stuck at home, and this is a great example of, well, you, you can in theory go anywhere around the world now without having to leave your house. That's something that many people can't have, they have that issue even without COVID-19, right? And so uh, thinking of ways of using this technology to open up information and participation to a larger group, I'd say is the other half of what we can do with XR Access. The primary goal being, um, well, we need to make it accessible first before we do that. Then once we do it, this is again like the internet, it opens up a whole new world of connection that we never had before. And problems, right? And we think about that too. But it, but it kind of opens up the aperture to be able to do a lot more than we have ever been, ever been able to do. Just adding to that, it's not just about you know being able to access something remotely as, as a lot of us are doing now. But let's say you're using augmented reality and you're a person that's deaf or hard of hearing, you might be able to put on a transparent headset in a meeting in a um, augmented reality meeting and be able to see real time captioning. So it's just things like that as well. People can see. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good point. Right, but if people with disabilities can't actually get these things up and running out of the box <laughs> uh, without outside help, then that's really limiting the power uh, that this technology can really uh, offer in the long term. We're ready so for the next, next slide, So I think here we can right. talk about inclusive design. You guys want to kind of give an a overview of what that means? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I do want to be cognizant of our time here because I do think uh, uh, we're, we're starting to run a little short. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's important for you know, everybody here uh, to make sure they, uh, whether you're a designer or a teacher or just anybody else in the process, um, that when you're designing, you don't just design for yourself, um, but you design to be inclusive of, of others whose people's experiences are, and capabilities are different than your own, right? Um, and that's a, a really challenging task that, that asks a lot of empathy out of our, uh, out of our educators, out of our uh, technology workers, um, and everybody else that's involved with bringing these uh, technologies and applications to fruition. Um, but it's one that ends up with, with great dividends um, when everybody can use it. Slide 
All right. This is amazing. Are you ready for some questions? Let's um, do it. Yeah. I think, uh, I think based on the time, I think, yeah, seems good. Well, we have 30 minutes, so we, we've got time. Um, so I have some right off the bat. So if you ha thank you, first of all. And, and for those um, that came in, uh, we're talking about um, accessibility as relates to XR and some of the challenges that have been faced with not only the self-isolation access and to tools and, and resources, but also dealing with those with, with that are differently able, disabled, whatever the politically correct term is, because I don't think there's anybody who's, who's disabled. We just differently abled here. Um, and um, so I have a thousand questions, but if you have a question, please hit the raise hand button um, that's down in the lower screen. Um, my first first question is, is are there standards out yet for dealing with AR? Because we have very different technologies. AR and VR are very different, you know, and then there's mixed reality, which is a whole other ball of wax. Are there any standards, guidelines that are out yet? Or is it just an extension of the the poor standards, the perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, you know, with the, with the um, ex web accessibility laws. Um, are, there, are there standards and where can we find them? Uh, I think those are definitely under development. Um, the, a lot of the, the standard uh, guidelines in terms of the, the WCAG um, mm -hmm. guidelines and the ones I mentioned do still apply. Um, in terms of ones that are specific to XR, uh, I know we have our uh, guidelines, uh, practices, policies group uh, working on wrangling some. Um, I know as well that the, the uh, W3C, I believe, put out a, um, a call yep. for feedback, essentially, on uh, and some XR uh, accessibility requirements. Um, so those are kind of in draft form and still you know, being perfected. But it, there's definitely a lot of folks trying to, to get those all in one place so that people who are, uh, you know, have the, the, the motive and the, the desire to make accessible technology have reliable guidelines to work from. Do you have links just, to those on your website or somewhere to at least start that process? So we have a working group page on our website. If you go to, um, it's just www.xraccess.org, we have a page that talks about the specific working groups, one of which is the guidelines, policies, and practices group that Dylan mentioned, which is actually led by Bill Curtis Davidson, who works for Magic Leap. Um, so they're working on exploring what does exist to figure out what we need to create. And I think that's a lot. <laughs> If I'm understanding correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Awesome. All right, let's see. Keely, you're out there. Hey, Keely, you have a question. Yes, hello. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you for holding this event. And I was actually wondering if any of you are addressing maybe accessibility on the socioeconomic side of things, like people who may not have the hardware or uh, aspects like that. How would you guys, how are you guys addressing it? So that's not something we've uh, focused on yet. We are still in, in pretty much what are the early stages. I think when, you know we really launched these this work uh, in September and have really been focused on building up what the working groups are doing, but also we are also focusing on research and education as well. So we're trying to determine right now what our focus areas are. And it, it's definitely something we're thinking about. I, I, I met with a woman, Kai, um, she was Kai XR, and she's a, she's a former teacher and talks a lot about, you know, students in, in Title I schools in particular not having access to these devices. So it's definitely on our radar, and, and we do have an education working group, and this is a great thing to bring to them and, and talk about exploring that. And everybody in this room and educators in general are, are welcome to, if you're interested in joining XR Access and the education group specifically, you can reach out to us. That's our email address up there. And I'm really the one that gets those emails. So it's really Deb in it, XR Access. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, um, Keely. Yeah, and I, I, I will just add to that as well that I think part of what we can do for that is make sure that any, any guidelines and things that we, that we do put out, uh, any tools that are helpful with that, run on all types of hardware, right? For ideally from the, the Google, Google Cardboard on up mm -hmm. to the, the high-powered tethered machines. Um, because, yeah, accessibility that's, that's only on the, the super high-end, uh, you know, multi-thousand dollar machines is 
is accessibility for people that, that may not have needed it as much to begin with, right? Um, there's, there's lots of people with, at that intersectionality of, of socioeconomic and uh, disability, uh, you know, physical disability um, that we want to make sure these guidelines will, will apply to and help out. Excellent. So, yeah, it is, there's democratizing and then there's accessibility. And those are often yeah. overlap, right? Right. 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 And any, uh, Joel, you were going to say? And then Daniel's yeah, got say, a question too. Uh, well, from, from my group as a hardware group, uh, I think this is something that will likely fit into that as we uh, we're looking at current platforms, but sort of that next generation of platforms. And again, um, are these companies thinking about, uh, and I know they're already trying to make them less expensive. Um, there's still a point where if it costs anything, it's going to be an issue for a large group. Um, but it fits into hardware. Like what kind of hardware can it run on? Um, can it actually, like this platform, for example, can run on uh, on a laptop, right? And so there's ways of connecting in, even if you don't have a, a headset, and that actually is part of the solution where, um, yes, get less expensive devices, can we seed devices, uh, can we repurpose devices, or can we also make it work uh, if you don't have a device? And, um, you know, it, it kind of touches all our different our di different areas. But it's something I'm very keenly aware of, not only uh, for reasons like this, but even in my job, you know, we have this issue with our, our customers. Um, they can't buy everybody a $3,000 VR you know, headset set up, uh, and we want it, we want to allow them to be able to use this more too. So I think you know, solving this for that will also solve it uh, in part for the question that Keely asked. Excellent. Yeah, that's part of the reason why we chose Altspace as kind of a as a temp home base right now is because of that access for as many devices as possible. So yeah, love that. Daniel, you have a question. Oh, I have lots of questions. I know. <laughs> first of all, I <laughs> always have lots of questions. Um, thank you, first of all, so much for sharing with us the work you're doing. And I'm, I'm really, I'm relieved that somebody is out there looking out for this because there's so much work needs doing. And um, I think we would love to do more accessibility work. Knowing you're out there doing it, we can collaborate with you now. And in particular, I want to, I, I really wanted to just ask if, Anybody here in the room has a very particular question or a challenge or a learner who they need accessibility solutions for or a situation like that. Can they reach out to you? Is it you, Devin, that email, um, info at access.org? Yeah, and, they can and, reach out to anything. Wonderful. And, and do you have a remit for interacting with schools, universities, colleges, that kind of thing with educators? Is that part of what, what you set out to do? Say that again, Daniel. I didn't hear the first part. Sure. Um, do you have kind of a semi-official remit for interacting and engaging with education, teachers, trainers, schools, and so on? Is that part of we your mission? We don't at the moment, but uh, the education group in particular is is still in its nascent stages. So we're trying to define right. what that looks like. So, you know, okay. we welcome your ideas, bring them to the table. Wonderful. Fantastic. And then I um, uh, kind of a follow on from that. Um, you must be aware with uh, you must be aware of WebXR. That's something personally I'm very excited about. So platforms like this, you download them and they run on various devices. But WebXR runs on the internet, on the web, and that makes it one step less of a, of a barrier to to entry. Is that is that something you're focusing on as well? And maybe Joel, I think that would be your area. Yeah, I mean it's definitely something we. we part of this, right, is the, the platform, right? Um, and right. the issue now is that all these, not only you have to download applications, but there's different platforms for Steam versus Oculus uh, versus right. uh, whatever else. Um, and that, like you said, that helps uh, bridge all of those. And again, even people yes. that don't have a headset. So that's, yes, that's part of this as well. Okay, thank you. Excellent, all right, wonderful. All right, thank you, Daniel, okay. Um, Raven, thank you for your patience. You're up. And anyone else, if you have a question, please hit the raise hand button down the lower right corner. Raven, you're on. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you so much for this presentation and the work that you're doing. Um, I'm really excited to go look at your website. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, I have, I guess, sort of a two-part question, um, and it has to do with representation. Um, in VR and in AR. Um, so one of the students who works in my um, VR AR lab 
one of her first encounters with VR was actually creating her alt space avatar. And this particular student wears a hijab and realized that she could not create an avatar that looked like her because there was no option for her to have a hijab. Um, and also in a lot of games, like this is not special to VR, but you know, here we are in alt space and we're all standing skinny people and, um, or robots. Although some of the robots are maybe are a little bit less skinny, but like, you know, there's such, <laughs> there's such limits on representation in a world that we can build anything we want. And so, um, I'm wondering if your group is taking a look at, um, just representation in experiences of people with disabilities of people, um, you know, who, who just span the broad intersectionality that we are in the real world. That's part one of my question. Okay. All right, let me let me respond to the first part of it. Um, all space right now is all the avatars are placeholder avatars. So they are specifically, um, I mean, this technologically dumbed down, optimized down to the lowest level. So these are not respective of normal avatars right now. All space is in remodel. So that's why there's no customization. We all have the same body type and limited robots. So just let you know, just qualification for all space right now. And did you want to um, have that addressed first and then your second question? Um, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. All right. So how are you dealing with avatars, presence, embodiment, and that part? Yeah, I, I think I could speak to that. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, that you're, you're absolutely right that things like representation uh, as well as you know, economic accessibility and social stigma of using headsets are all absolutely parts of accessibility. Um, I think they are certainly important. I think it's something that that uh, we we have tried to support where we can. Um, that said, I, I think our our efforts right now are uh, kind of based on more of the the technical requirements um, that are going into the construction of these than the uh, you know kind of avatar and uh, the you know uh, representation requirements because I think those are. Um, a lot harder to to express on a, a you know, kind of that platform and that that broad level, but it's absolutely something that I think um, we would encourage any designers, any developers to include uh, as part of making their their game accessible. So I think it, it will definitely make it into any types of guidelines and things that we put out, um, and you, as well as the, you know what things like uh, customizability, right? Let people uh, customize and put in their own avatars and let people uh, especially make sure that the tools for creation are accessible to everybody, um, to people with disabilities, to people with, with you know, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, but only once we have people not only as consumers but as full-on creators, I think we're really going to see a lot of these accessibility issues uh, kind of quashed for good. I would say one of the things we hope to get out of XR Access is to definitely spur dialogue on the importance of making sure XR is accessible. So I think, you know, the more we can all talk about, you know, even the people in the audience, the more we can talk about these accessibility issues publicly on social media um, with our fellow educators is, it, I think that's really important. There's actually a hashtag, if, if you're on Twitter, there's a hashtag that people use on Twitter and LinkedIn. It's, it's uh, hashtag A11Y, and that sort of brings you into the accessibility conversation as it relates to technology. I think bringing up conversations like that, making sure people see that that, that is a component of the need uh, is important. Excellent, are you ready for part two, <laughs> David? <laughs> yes. Okay. yes. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, so part two, um, I'm curious, to what extent, um, maybe not particular to your organization, but just in terms of developers out there who are creating um, VR, AR, XR um, applications and tools and hardware, to what extent are those people um, like explicitly looking for individuals with disabilities or with differences to serve in in development and in um, leadership roles in those organizations and like to what extent are those people involved in the design process way beyond you know test this or are compensated for their um, their feedback well 
Sorry, I was going to say, if, uh, my audio cut off for part of your question there, so I apologize for that, but was it basically asking how uh, the, the folks with disabilities that, um, you know, we'd ask to take part in things like user testing uh, are compensated for their efforts? Um, and the compensated or like, yeah, thanks, Maya. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. In, there. Um, so, are they being included in the decision making process, the feedback process, and compensated as through that process as well? Right. Yeah, that's a, a really great question because I think it, it definitely goes back again to making sure that uh, for folks with disabilities, they're you know all of these products are made with uh, with them and not just kind of designed with them and not just designed at them. Right. Um, I think uh, we've definitely, you know, uh, been trying to, as much as possible, uh, bring in um, people and organizations uh, that have disabilities into um, XR Access and, and get their um, get their feedback on these types of things. Uh, I think for us, we're all, for the for the most part, you know, nonprofit. I don't think any of us are paid, uh, so it's it's um, you know. It, it, the, the compensation is is uh, is the same as, as we're getting in terms of um, getting that be making sure that their their voices are heard. Um, I think it's definitely something that uh, you know is in part of the guidelines that that we want to put out is again mm -hmm. do user testing with people with uh, with disabilities and pay them. Right? Absolutely, you can't uh, ask for for uh, something like that for free. Um, and so getting proper compensation um, uh, for those, uh, the, you know, all your user testers is something that I think is, is absolutely vital. Um, and I can, add add to, mm -hmm. sorry, I can just add that, that XR Access, the, the members of XR Access, there are a lot of people with disabilities that are, are part of it, including myself. Um, so that has come up in conversation a lot. And I think people are keeping that in mind as we push our work forward and we'll continue to make sure with anything we're working on, even if it's a research project, it's, you know, whatever, that we have multiple perspectives in the conversation. Excellent. I, so with that in mind, um, to, as a follow-up question to what Raven mentioned, are there tools available that help those that do not have those different abilities um, to actually experience that. Now, I know there's some apps, but I was wondering what you would recommend for people who are in development to actually see what that experience is like or to hear what that experience or to feel what that experience is like. Hey guys, have you seen, uh, I'm just talking to my fellow panelists, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, that is coming up um, May, I wanna say 21st, but don't, you know, help me on that. But I believe on their website, they have um, ways you can sort of experience that. They have suggestions of how you can put yourself into that situation. So if you want to check out, um, if you could just, if you just Google Global Accessibility Awareness Day, you should find the information there. Well, those mostly apply to web-based technologies. Right. Do they have XR listed in there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know, actually. Don't know. Um, I, I will say, I think you do have to be very careful when you simulate a disability to you know, be assuming that you now have the experience of someone who has that disability, right? Because putting on a, a blindfold for 10 Absolutely. minutes is extremely different from being Very blind for 10 so. years. Yes. Um, and so I think that the, from you know, my, my experience, and you know, l let me know if, if you all feel differently, but I think it's, it's you know, you can definitely uh, try out some of these um, things that, that purport to give you the experience of someone who has a disability. Um, and that can be useful for, you know, things like, uh, just as a, a kind of a brainstorming exercise, design exercise, like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I just realized this isn't gonna work unless you can see, or this mm -hmm. isn't gonna work unless you have two hands. But when it comes to actually learning what it's like to have a disability, listen to people with disabilities. That's Absolutely. the only way to do it. Listen to their Absolutely. lived experiences. Uh, yeah. Because simply trying to simulate it is never going to give you their, their lived experience. Absolutely, absolutely. And I was also thinking of the empathy angle, but excellent, excellent advice. All right, so let's see who else do we have on the list here. Aaron, you're next. Yeah, hi. 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 Yeah, so you're, I was yeah. sort of just wondering. Um, 
is there any sort of tools like on the developer side on like to help with implementing like tools to make sort of a get I mean in my case it's I'm studying games design so it's making VR games uh, in the future so like, is there any tools that sort of help I guess with implementing accessibility into games because see if you're trying to make like a game accessible to like colorblind as well as being able to be played with one hand as well as being able to be accessible for a lot of people then it's going to add like a lot of work especially if you're working in like a small team like in terms of actually implementing it mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a that's an excellent question um the answer is, is definitely yes there are certainly uh, a lot of tools on the developer side to to make things more accessible um which is great because it's really the developer side where that needs to happen. Um, and I think if, if it's something that as a developer you're thinking about from the start um, and you have the, the right resources, which is something we're looking to, to help provide, um, it, it becomes a lot easier to just have accessibility be in there. Um, to answer your question, I think there's, there's definitely a lot, uh, a goodly number of Unity plugins um, that you can just basically drop in uh, and attach to, if you're working in Unity, um, you know, attach to objects to do things like make them uh, screen reader accessible. Um, if you're looking on, on OpenXR, there's, uh, there's things like alternate, um, the image tag equivalent, but uh, you know, alt text, but for 3D objects. Um, I know we are putting together a list of those. Um, I'm sure that there are uh, some that we could uh, uh, put on the, the website as well, but um, absolutely, I think it's it's there are resources out there, and uh, I think soon we, we will have a list of those. And in the meantime, if you can tell us, uh, you know, from your perspective, um, and you know, not necessarily right this instant, but for anybody who's a, a developer, um, if you want to reach out to us and tell us what's going to be useful to you. Um, we will make sure that that our list of resources include that as well. All right, thanks. Yeah, and by the way, this this goes to the fact that we don't have all the answers right now. There are, as Dylan mentioned, there's resources out there. Uh, various groups have put together um, bits and pieces. Uh, there's Unity plugins. Uh, there's work the W3C is doing. There's guidance out there. Uh, our goal is to bring that together come up with an easier way to reference all of that uh, and then also fill some of the gap because we know there's some gap uh, and, and make it easier for you. So right now there's, yes, the short answer is yes, there are resources out there. The long answer is it needs to be better as, as, as uh, which is why we're here. All right. That's beautiful. Now I, I have a question and then Daniel um, and then anyone else, if you have a question, please hit the raise hand button. Um, You've talked about some add-on capabilities. Um, so alt, I want to talk about alt space for just a second um, because I know there's accessibility challenges that are here. Um, this is built with Unity. So do, are you aware of anything that is supports Unity, can be added on through Unity, um, through the engine and whatnot, that will add like captioning or, or high contrast influencers or anything like that, that may or may not be able to be overlaid into something like Altspace, which is Unity-based. There are some proprietary stuff, but it is basically Unity-based. Or other Unity-based products, or, you know, just in general? Um, I, mean, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I do know that if you look in the Unity store, there's definitely several that can uh, improve with things like um, yeah, letting you add uh, you know, alternate image tags, letting you insert um, things like uh, uh, visual adjustments um, for people with color blindness, or um, we have somebody in the, the application accessibility group who developed a plugin um, for people with ocular degeneration. It can kind of, you attach mm -hmm. it to your cameras and it can warp oh, nice. the, um, the view so to, to help accommodate for that. So those are, are definitely out there. Um, as Joel mentioned, I've heard we, we, we're not quite at the level where we have those kind of you know at the at the drop of a hat, um, mm -hmm. but it is a, a, a list that we are trying to put together. Um, and once we have it, we will absolutely share it out. Fantastic, wonderful. I have I, I do know that Second Life is working on on adding simultaneous um, captioning, and then one time Altspace was working on it as well, but they lost funding. 
but I would love to see those things be added right in to the process. And what we, yeah, Joel, what were you going to add? Well, so I was going to say this is kind of this is the goal. Is what we want to do is, uh, in, from my perspective of the hardware and even platforms like the operating systems, this is the kind of thing that is built into Windows and Mac and iOS and Android um, that allows those platforms to have these features that then can be turned on in apps that are built the right way. Um, that doesn't really exist in the AR VR space right now. So there, there's no easy answer. Um, uh, often it might be a plugin that you have to actually then bake into the application itself. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. a plugin that you can just turn on for alt space, but that's the dream. And so we need to figure out how to get there where you can just say, hey, I have a specific need in alt space. This plugin is standard across Unity apps. It enables you know, this feature and it solves your your issue without with just a click of a button or you know or whatever so as far as i know we're not really there yet uh Del, unless there's something uh out there that i haven't seen but that's that's where we want to go all right well we only have a few more minutes left because we are unfortunately running up against another event but i want to i want to get to another um i have i have so many questions i would like to invite you all to um to have us do an educators in vr come back and let's do some educators in vr events that deal with this more specifically to help address people's won't you don't you want to hear more about this yeah yeah and um oh, yeah. now you've got oh, the yeah. practice we need to get you going on again yes just yep yeah, well all right daniel let me finish my sentence then you can ask sure. and then we'll close it out because we are so what I'm going to, um, so I just want people to know that we do have another event that's after this. We're going to have a portal that's going to go to that event when the doors open. But if you want to continue this conversation, please stay here. You'll be unmuted and you can keep the conversation going here as well. We just have a lot of events back to back. Daniel, you're on. Thank you very much. Um, right. So I'm just going to jump up here if I may. Um, again, thank you so much. I. While I was listening to you talking about, um, I think, who was it at the front here? Uh, somebody was asking their studying game, de game design, are there any implementation resources? I wondered, if I'm not mistaken, you, you're you working with quite an array of companies. Uh, I, on your website, there's like 140, I don't know if it's partners or collaborators or something like that. I just wonder, with, with all that kind of backing and, 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 and interest behind you, could there be scope for like an incentive to developers? Could you create some kind of a competition or some kind of an incentive whereby you invite, because there are so many amazing people out there developing with ideas in this, and they might not pursue it. They might have an idea and kind of let it lie. But if you can wake them up and kind of bring them together around a cause, so some kind of competition or some grant or funding scheme, could you harness some of that potential to really accelerate and boost the efforts in that area just a thought i love that idea yeah yeah no that's a, a great plan I, I think something that that we had you know considered uh, at one point was a you know xr access stamp of approval or something right if you <laughs> yeah. Are, yeah 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 if you, if you mm -hmm. get half of all of these requirements then maybe it gets featured or you know we we can help uh promote you know the the designers and developers that have taken the, the time and effort to make their applications fully accessible. Um, yeah. I think that that's something that I would like to see in the long term. And I think something that, um, you know, as you said, there's there's part of the, the big challenge here is, you know, XR Access, we want to help give everybody the information on how to make their, uh, their apps accessible, but they still need to want to make them accessible, right? Right. And that's a challenge right. that absolutely we can't solve alone. Um, right. I think it's something that is going to take, uh, you know, nonprofits. Uh, it's going to take the the companies. It's going to take governments, uh, and it's yeah. going to take people and and individuals and educators. Uh, you know, everybody pushing to say, I'm not going to use this application unless it is accessible to everybody. Right, and that's been oh, okay. very much our approach here with the community is to to harness the resources together, and um, the number of wonderful projects that have resulted out, out of just having people in the same room and a conversation starting here or on the Discord server, that's what we live for, to see mm -hmm. people with ideas go off and do good things and just give them the platform to come together and, and have that spark. So, yeah, um, like I, I would love that. We'd love to have you back, right? Yeah, absolutely, and have more, yeah, absolutely. more intimate discussions about this. 
So I'd, I'd like to, as we start to close this out, I, um, because we do have the other event, but please stay here. The conversation will, ow, Daniel. The conversation will be um, op open and, um, but I do want to say um, to all of you um, in my in our thanks and appreciation. It, when, the, when the Sydney Olympics um, were sued because their website was not accessible, the court said one of the most profound things that I just loved. The battle was, well, we can't fix it. For the Olympics Committee to make our website expensive, I mean, fix it would, to fix it, it would be too expensive and take too long. And the court responded back, if you'd done it right in the first place, mm -hmm. it would not have cost so much and it would not take any time. And the problem we have right now that you are helping to solve, but we need it five years ago, so I'm, we're 100% supportive, is that we need to know how to do it right in the first place and going forward. So thank you for being the leaders in helping us get to that right place, whatever that means and however that looks. So everybody, give them up for some great love and loving and heart and applause <laughs> for helping us get to the right place and so that we can make sure that when we say it's inclusive, yes, yes, yes. You made it in, good, yeah, thank you. Yes, I did. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you. All right, the um, thank the you audio. Very much, guys. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, yep, yeah, I'm gonna come out here to the audience again. It's not to steal thunder. Anyone who wants to stay, please stay. But I'm gonna throw a portal to the next event, which is the uh, Daniel. Could you tell them about it while I'm looking for it? <laughs> Daniel, are you here? Daniel's now not I, here. I am. No, oh, I okay. Your audio cut out. Go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Our extended challenge. Right. Yes, yes, the VR. So, Daniel, can you tell them about that while I'm doing the portal? All right. Well, we've got Rohit here. There it is. Rohit. Um, yes, but he's not on it? megaphone or anything. Nope. He's supposed ah, to be in the yes. event, already prepared, ready to go. He better not be in here. <laughs> <laughs> he's, all right. And this, uh, so, um, okay, if you want to join this other event, go back to events and find the, um, the VRX challenge. No, click is the it? portal. Click the port. Uh, there you go. Click the portal. This is about um, a challenge set. You're not on a megaphone. Thank you. I'm <laughs> okay. There you go. Now you. Okay. I hope you can hear me now. So click this portal, please, if you want to find out more about an exciting challenge set by Rohit Chauba and the VRX challenge, which is um, a uh, student development students. challenge. High school, High school students. student development Sorry. challenge. They're associated with real world events, but this one is starting, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in VR. Uh, the project will be running from the 17th <laughs> till uh, the, Maybe. something like that, till just yep. before our students in VR uh, yep. conference. Yep, and we gotta in, go, uh, it's starting now. So okay, guys, we'll see, see you there, Let's go. We'll find out more. And all thank right. you all, we're gonna talk. Right. Yeah, thanks, thanks for it, coming everybody. Right. Right. Yeah, we'll have everybody. yeah. We'll have thanks a few people. Yeah. Um, we might have some people stay and ask you some more questions. So, anybody who hasn't joined that event, uh, you're welcome to stay. Uh, if you have any more questions, we can take some more questions for uh, Dylan and Joel, if you like. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can either. Oh, we have got the raise hand function here. So we got Vinny. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, just barely, you're very quiet. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, there you go. So, um, I was just wondering, um, there are games that use external mods, like not add-ons that are overlays, but actually external applications like Mod Organizer for, you know, Fallout, Skyrim, and maybe there's a way to use those instead, like put uh, some kind of external functionality or script or whatever into Outspace or some other solutions for XR or for AR. You see what I'm getting to? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. Um, and I think it's something that, that is doable for some games uh, or some applications. Um, I think the, the challenges that we've seen in, in talking to folks about the, the possibility of modding is that um, many many companies like, you know, do not like mods being around. Um, and it also generally requires a, a heavy amount of um, kind of secondhand coding uh, and, and a lot of work by folks in the community. 
Um, and so I think it's it's definitely better than nothing. But I think we're we're trying to hope to shift the the you know the the, the responsibility of making things accessible to the creators and not not the the, you know, the, the folks that are using it after the, the it's released. But thank you for yeah, the insight. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, other other questions, folks? Have? Uh, I'll say in the meantime that it's something that, that I think we we did talk about in a bit, uh, you know, leading up to this is the accessibility of um, alt space itself. Uh, and it's, there's definitely some challenges um, that folks have who don't have because I think it's it's only Windows, right? Windows or VR. Um, yes, that's one. That's one yeah. uh, challenge is is um, the Windows divide, if you like. Everyone's yeah. waiting for Apple to join the join the party, and they're taking their time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I think that's actually, I asked about that, and the issue is with, um, with Apple, not with, um, not with Altspace. So it's mm -hmm. the fact that Apple hasn't made the effort to reach Altspace as opposed to Altspace not being compatible, if you like. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's, that's fair. I think it's, it's, it is, though, in, I, in contrast to you know, OpenXR systems, right, that you can plug exactly. in from a controller. Uh, even within, um, you know, within things uh, within Altspace, there's possibilities for systems like uh, having um, you know automated camera bots or having something that somebody could yeah. could observe or control yeah. without having to log in from a device and without, very good point uh, having a headset, right? So I think there's there's point. workarounds to it, but it's something that we definitely need to think about um, for. It should be an option have... on your event to just click live stream and it automatically right. streams somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah. think for we've been talking about how to make our symposium accessible, and it's it's um, we'd, we'd love to do it fully in VR, but I don't think it's quite quite there yet. Not quite there yet. I agree. And the other thing is, I mean, uh, Altspace is owned by Windows, and Windows is all over text to speech, speech to text, and uh, and closed caption, you know, uh, caption and stuff mm -hmm. like that. With the right with the right will, it can't be it can't take much to switch that on for something like Altspace to that functionality. Yeah, Microsoft right. well, is very, very good go with, with accessibility and, and I'm, I'm very curious if they're thinking, how much they're thinking about it in mixed reality because they also have the HoloLens as well as this and everything right. else they do is very accessible. Um, right. This is not. <laughs> so um, we had a speaker, could... um, Thomas Lewis from uh, Microsoft XR, the mixed reality uh, lab there, he, he gave a speech. And he shared, uh, him and his colleague, Anson Ho, shared something called the Immersive Reader. But it'd be interesting to have a conversation with them because, yeah, it's, um, they've got this amazing platform. And it's an alt space, funnily now, with COVID-19 and remote collaboration, Teams is getting a lot of uh, attention. Yep. But also, um, the fact that alt space exists is reaching Microsoft, apparently, like Microsoft headquarters, because they've been quite hands off with it. They bought alt space up, but they haven't really messed around with it too much. But now, yeah. It's it's reaching their 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 horizon, so maybe they'll they'll uh, switch on some functions for it. Yeah, I hope that'd be yeah, good. That'd so. be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, were there, Thank were you there so much. From... I, oh sure. Um, yeah, I mean, last opportunity, guys. Uh, I think we'll we'll call it a day now, and we'll have you guys back as well. I know Devin's gone again. That might be her Oculus Go can overheat sometimes. Um, she did well to come back in a second time. Guys, listen, yeah. thank you so, so much. I'm really glad we connected, and I hope I hope to, you know, continue and develop this relationship. Let's talk yeah. um, about having you guys back. We do have the Students in VR uh, conference coming up. Have I linked you in with our Students in VR um, team yet? Have I done that yet? I don't uh, think so. I don't no. think so. I'd love to, right. uh, to right. be in touch with you. I'll them. jump on that right now. I'll write you an email uh, with um, Angelina right now to see if there's any way we can bring in a little bit of something. I mean, it's quite short notice now, but I think that's something we're going to be growing as well, students in VR, as a, as a, as a project beyond the conference. So lovely, uh, would love to have you guys in on that conversation, okay? Absolutely. And, you know, we're on Fantastic. I'll, I'll definitely try to, to find some more time, more battles to attend, because these are really great. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, guys, be safe, be sound. Uh, may your families be, be good as well. And um, 
see you see you in the metaverse very soon. And I'll yep. send that email to somebody again. <laughs> thanks, Joel. Yeah, like, thanks, thanks Dylan. Yep. And say thanks, thank Daniel. you to Devin as well, right? We will. Yeah, we'll do. All right, guys. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to leave. The, the space will stay open. If you want to stay, don't worry. You know, Take your time making your way. Uh, see you guys around. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, I think um, if anybody has any more questions, uh, absolutely feel free to reach out. Um, you can do the, uh, the all the information up here. Um, I'm also at, uh, at usabilityfox on Twitter. Anybody wants to reach out there? Um, Joel, do you have a, any accounts you want to plug? Uh, at, at Joel Seth, yeah. Uh, join us on Twitter and join us in XR Access too. We should have mentioned that. Uh, we can follow yeah. up with that. But any, anybody here is welcome to join us. So. Um, Absolutely. Good job, Dylan. Right. Thanks, yes, everybody. Too. If anybody's still there. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm All right. hopping.